This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome. This is the sixth and final presentation in our series on developmental disabilities as part of the OSHER UCSF Mini Med School for the Public. We are delighted that you're here tonight and hope that you'll tune us in and catch any lectures that you might have missed on YouTube as part of the series of teaching tapes of UCSF. And I'd like to introduce my partner in developmental disabilities, Jerry Collins Bride of the UCSF School of Nursing. And I'd like to introduce my partner, Dr. Lucy Crane, from uh, a Professor Emeritus from UCSF and also Professor at uh, Stanford Children's Hospital. Uh, and Lucy and I are very, um, happy to be hosting this series, but also to be presenting together. We've talked about it for many years, being partners in crime, uh, but haven't actually co-presented together. So this is especially uh, a treat for us, and we hope that, uh, that you enjoy this session. Uh, initially, we were going to start off with this session, but we thought we would save the best for last, huh? And the best for last is going to be is our, Elizabeth Is our other Grigsby. partner in crime. This is Liz Grigsby. I'm Elizabeth Grisby. I'm a patient of Jerry Collins Wright. And you're an advocate like nobody else. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a really big advocate for people with developmental disabilities, just for people with disabilities all around. Great. So we're going to start off uh, tonight with uh, Lucy is going to kick it off with a historical perspective from the pediatrician's perspective. And then I'm going to talk about some of the um, issues with adult health care. And we're going to wind up our session with, um, with Liz um, talking about her own personal experiences with personal and professional with, uh, with disabilities. Thank okay. you. One of the things that happens when you have emeritus after your title is that you get to do historical perspectives. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're going to talk about some of the sentinel events in developmental disabilities uh, services as they've progressed since the late 1800s. And one of the things that I like to remind people of is we use some really, really nasty words uh, a century ago like handicapped, mental retardation, and a variety of others that I won't even mention tonight. But the origin of handicapped began in Dickinsonian times when chimney sweeps were very common in London and other big cities. And chimney sweeps were mostly little boys living in poverty. They were lowered into chimneys. It was really an awful, dirty, dangerous job. And this is, I mean, you can find anything on the internet now. And these little boys would draw lots or passes. If you drew a lot out of the cap, that meant you didn't have to go down into the chimney. And so all the boys would crowd around, and usually the smallest or the one with disabilities was the one left with his hand in the cap. That's the origin of handicapped. Unfortunately, it remained a part of the vocabulary of developmental disabilities for more than 100 years. Also of interest is 
that there were no services for children or adults with disabilities in the late 1800s. The other interesting thing is there were no services for children who were abused or neglected. In fact, children were often treated as um, indentured servants and made to do the most despicable jobs working in sulfur mines and things like that. In 1874, the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, they were ahead of children and adults. SPCA assisted the founding of the Society for Protection of Cruelty to Children. That was the origin not only of child abuse prevention, but also of developmental disability services for children. Minnesota in 1893 was the first state to enact a state program for handicapped children. In 1912, the Children's Bureau was established by Congress. It was the predecessor of the Maternal and Child Health MCHB Bureau and worked to establish at that time child labor regulations were the number one priority for the Children's Bureau and to, it began to assist children with disabilities. More landmarks included in 1935. There were large intervals in between some of these acts, as you'll notice. There also were changes in Congress and changes in the federal administration. And uh, we don't have time to go into that, but we see that in modern day. In 1935, the Social Security Act was implemented along with Title V, which implemented CCS, the California Children's Services, um, and that was set up primarily because tuberculosis was epidemic and endemic in our country in the middle of the last century, as was polio. Tens of thousands of children and adults had poliomyelitis before the advent of the preventive polio vaccine in the 1950s. And there had to be services for iron lungs. There had to be services for children who needed um, various devices to help with mobility. And um, that led to a longstanding number of institutions and administrative uh, regulations that today continue. In 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education had to do with integration because of racial discrimination. And I put it in here because integration and inclusion are parts of education for people with disabilities, and it's a sentinel event in the history of DD. In 1960, Massachusetts was the first state to regulate and implement and mandate the screening of newborns for metabolic diseases. You know, when the baby's born and gets the heel stick and uh, it's sent off to a laboratory somewhere to check for 24 or 30 metabolic errors, including PKU. We didn't have that in California until 1964. And the commonest cause of mental retardation or intellectual disability until we had that screen was, anybody care to guess? Hypothyroidism. Congenital hypothyroidism, imminently treatable. And it prevented mental retardation. It prevented intellectual disability. And um, so we've made some progress. In 1965, Public Law 8997 enacted Medicare and Medicaid. In 65, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, Public Law 94142 was implemented. And until that time, there was no special education there were no classes that were designed, no teachers who were tra trained specially to help children who had intellectual disability or 
motor movement problems or developmental disabilities of any type. In 1969, California enacted through the efforts of Senator Lanterman and others, the Lanterman Developmental Disabilities Act and the Lanterman Petrie Short Act, which is a mental health act. And this became the foundation for the regional center system of California. I don't know, Jerry, if you're gonna be talking about Willowbrook, but um, uh, if you want to see some really unbelievable but true uh, YouTube footage, look at the news coverage of Willowbrook and then Attorney General Robert Kennedy's visit to that state hospital for people with developmental disabilities in New York State. He termed it the last great disgrace. I'd like to think that it was the last great disgrace, but I was a regional center physician in 1972 in California, and Sonoma State Hospital was a disgrace, as were a number of the other state hospitals in California. We have come a long way, thank goodness. Section 504 of the Social Security Act, the Rehab Act, prevents discrimination among agencies which receive federal funds, and it expanded the services to include those for the elderly, blind, and disabled. In 1981, Title V, remember that was MCHB, converted to the HRSA MCH block grants, and in I'm not gonna go through all of these word for word. You'll have this in the handout. And just know that some of these things like the waiver for home and community-based services, the waiver for uh, um, services that help people with in-home health care, had to be implemented into law, had to be regulated by legislation for major change to happen. The Social Security and Supplemental Security Income Acts in 1984 created government sources of services and eligibility criteria for supplemental income for people with disabilities. People with disabilities couldn't be independent without some assistance in terms of finding jobs, finding housing, and this was it. This was the origin of it. In 1987, Surgeon General Koop's report on children with special health care needs led to expansion of Medicaid and budget reform for children and adults with disabilities who were allowed to apply for SS developmental income. And that was something that included people who had to have tracheostomy tubes, people who had to have gastrostomy tubes, who otherwise would have had to live the remainder of their lives in the hospital. And this was earth shaking for those individuals. The Public Law 94142 was expanded in 1990 to um, include early start and the young children, the early intervention from three to six, before it had just been six to 22. And now in California and many other states, it's even younger. And fortunately, the at-risk population of these young children, which was excluded because of um, the budget going south uh, a few years ago, and now with the, the recovery in the California budget, at-risk children again are eligible for regional center services and early intervention programs. And in 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, which promotes the full inclusion and introduction of self-advocacy movement was implemented. So. Next year is the 25th birthday of the ADA. Happy birthday. <laughs> Full inclusion classes are often taken for granted anymore, but when I grew up in a small town in Kentucky in the last century, <laughs> 
there were no special education classes. Children who had developmental disabilities lived at home or they went to a state hospital and talk about bad state hospitals. Kentucky was a poor state, is still. And the state hospitals, which I first visited as a medical student in Kentucky, were disasters. So now, thanks to the legislation, there are full inclusion classes everywhere. The self-advocacy movement was preceded by parental advocacy for their children with developmental disabilities. And um, Mrs. Beckett, whose daughter Katie was um, unfortunately afflicted with um, meningitis when she was an infant. And this damaged her brain and made her dependent on um, oxygen and a tracheostomy for the remainder of her life. People thought that she would not live to graduate from the newborn nursery. She lived to be nearly 40 years of age. And she lived in her own apartment. And I'll show you a picture of her in a minute. Family Voices was established about that same time by Katie's mother and a group of other parents around the country and remains a very vocal advocacy group Legislative advocacy was not really heard of from parents until the Katie Beckett case and some of the other parents who brought to Washington, brought to their state legislatures the demands that their children had a right to appreciate their optimal potential and to live in as normal an as environment as any other child. The Olmstead decision in 1999 really furthered the realization of self-advocacy and full integration of people with disabilities. And I think you and Liz will talk about that more. This is Katie when she was about 35 at home with her um, uh, respiratory equipment and um, she had a good life. Definitions are um, things that you can read later and think about. Everybody knows that a disability is an umbrella term. Uh, it relates to impairments of activity or limitations and participatory restrictions concerning a person's functions. It can also be described as the World Health Organization stated in 2001 as a dynamic interaction between a health condition and the environment. One in seven Americans has disabilities, according to the Institute of Medicine. 14% of US adults have limited activities of daily living and social activity, and 20% of children have disabilities. It's pretty impressive. A developmental disability originates before age 22. It's a condition which results in major impairment of cognitive and or social functioning and the existence of significant limitations in three or four of these separate adaptive areas, communication, learning, self-care, mobility, self-direction, capacity for independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. Types of developmental disabilities can be congenital or acquired. Major causes of developmental disabilities include genetic causes, and we know a lot more about genetics than we did um, even 10 years ago. The Human Genome Project has opened up such an explosion of knowledge and new avenues for research. Metabolic, I already mentioned the inborn errors of metabolism. Injury, uh, lack of oxygen at birth, lack of oxygen any time, near drowning injuries were um, the commonest uh, cause of admission for acquired injuries in the early 1970s in California, and um, trauma, motor vehicle accidents, and child abuse, unfortunately. Perinatal toxins, we'll talk about fetal alcohol syndrome in a minute abuse and neglect, malnutrition, starvation. 
How to make a diagnosis. We've heard a lot about diagnosis for different entities over the last uh, six weeks. And taking a, a careful medical history and physical exam after doing screening is crucially important. Developmental screening should be done by all pediatricians and child health professionals at prescribed intervals and should be accompanied by referral to developmental specialists if there are concerns. Um, some of those um, additional evaluations includes evaluation by a psychologist who is trained in working with people with developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities as well as learning disorders. Laboratory and genetic studies uh, are sometimes indicated. Um, we uh, had a presentation by uh, Dr. Emily Chen from Kaiser Genetics, and uh, we didn't go in depth into all of the seemingly endless genetic tests that can be uh, considered, but there are a lot of them. And if they are indicated, they are very important. Conferring with parents and deciding where to go with a diagnosis was something that she emphasized. Cerebral palsy is a um, topic that we didn't really focus on in our last five sessions. Um, you just can't cover it all, you know? And, um, but cerebral palsy is a motor movement disorder, occurs two in a thousand live births. There are various types, including the spastic, which seems to be most common. Often um, assistive devices like walkers or wheelchairs are needed for mobility. Most, a good many people who have cerebral palsy do not have intellectual disability. They may have speech disabilities, dysphonia, but sometimes they are whizzes on computers, right, Liz? <laughs> and prematurity is a major cause of developmental disabilities, often is implicated in seizure disorders, as Dr. Lowenstein mentioned and described the various types of seizures. One thing that's important to acknowledge is that Spontaneous abortions or miscarriages occur 15 and 100 pregnancies. And of those <clears throat> spontaneously aborted fetuses, half have chromosome abnormalities. Maybe they are miscarried for a reason. 6% of stillborn infants have chromosome defects, some of which are incompatible with life. I'm not going to have time for all of the identified genetic syndromes, but Down syndrome is well known with a wide range of intellectual and functional abilities. And the average IQ of people with Down syndrome is in the moderately delayed range, trainable and educable. Intellectual disability is defined as an IQ which is greater than two standard deviations below the mean or less than 70. Deficits in two or more areas of adaptive function. It's more common in gestations less than 32 weeks. Remember that the normal gestation is 40 weeks. The incidence is three to five percent of the population. <coughs> Fragile X syndrome is the commonest cause of genetically um, mediated intellectual disability, but not all people with fragile X are intellectually disabled, as shown by this honor student uh, in high school. Some are severely affected. Two brothers with fragile X syndrome. Fragile X syndrome is, as I said, the most common inherited cause of mental retardation. It's an X-linked disease, which means that the mother carries the gene and most severely affected are the male offspring. The characteristics of fragile X syndrome for males, you'll see listed here, prominent ears, delayed speech, hyperactivity, and about 40% have autistic-like features or may be diagnosable with autism. 
This is a little girl with fragile X. Fetal alcohol disorders is another common cause of intellectual disability. It is preventable by not drinking alcohol during pregnancy. That's why there's the little label on the beer can or the whiskey bottles to warn people if they're pregnant, don't drink. This is a great poster from the ARC. Last year, 40,000 babies had their first drink before they were born. The face of a child with fetal alcohol effects is identifiable, and there are specific measurements in terms of determination of the smallness of the eyes. The um, upper lip is elongated, and the philtrum, which is this, is not defined. It's simple and flat and the upper lip is very thin. There are variations, as you see on the right side of the slide, in the size of the lip, and also there are variations in terms of the severity of deficits. I'm not gonna talk about autism spectrum disorders because that was well covered by Dr. Bennett last week, and I am going to just quickly mention that there are specific indications for genetic studies chromosomes, arrays, or special tests, but it boils down to clinical findings, family history, recurrent miscarriages, or stillbirths, and affected other family members, particularly first-degree relatives. I'm done. <laughs> okay, in the next 30 minutes, I'm gonna try to whiz through uh, what happens when the kids grow up, when they become adults, and they move on to the adult health care system. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a lot about um, health care. I appreciate the historical perspective and also um, the pediatrician's role in diagnosis and supporting uh, kids or, uh, um, with special needs and families and caregivers. Um, and now they move on to the adult system, and it's a whole different world. Um, just to uh, do a little bit of backdrop, we had talked about this slide in the first session of this series, but just as a, as a healthcare provider to think about when seeing people with special needs, that those impairments do start very young in life, and they are permanent, and they will affect some, some um, part of cognition, which is thinking, some part of neuromuscular function, uh, some degree of uh, changes in the seizure threshold, um, certainly uh, increased risk for mental health issues, and then sensory processing issues such as vision, hearing, tact tactile sense. It's important to keep that as a backdrop when we think about evaluating healthcare issues for um, children, but adults also with um, developmental disabilities. Lucy gave a great um, review of what the past has been, and I'd like to say in the future, in the present and in the future, I'm hoping that we're moving more towards a social model of disability, where we're looking at that the actual disability is not really from the individual, but from the environment and, the, and society that has um, reluctance uh, to actually accommodate the needs of people who are different. And so the social model really looks at the combination of the environment, the, the physical environment, the social environment, and then the individual who is different. And that intersection oftentimes is what the disability is all about. I think Liz will speak more to that, but I'm gonna leave it at that. So transitioning from that pediatric world to the adult world is tricky. Uh, families and, and uh, individuals with special needs have grown up together with the pediatrician. They have formed an incredibly uh, strong bond, uh, a close relationship, oftentimes a very close friendship. It's really hard to let go. I think it's hard to let go from the pediatrician's perspective, from the family, from the individual's perspective. Um, and some of that is the relationship, but some of it is also a lack of confidence of who am I, who's going to see and take care of my child as well as that pediatrician has. Um, uh, families are also sometimes worried about that young adults of, of any ability do not advocate very well for themselves. So who's going to speak for them if for some reason I can't? 
Our healthcare system also has many issues. Fortunately, we are moving to electronic health records everywhere, which is great. Uh, but uh, having been in practice for over 30 years, there's reams of really rich information in paper medical records that are no longer accessible to any of us. And so uh, uh, our systems do not, we don't all have the same electronic health systems. So our systems are, are at a mismatch. In the future, I hope that that improves, but that certainly is one of the issues. Um, and certainly the, uh, the lack of availability of skilled adult health care providers is, is a major issue, continues to be an issue, and we are so delighted to be able to, to do these sessions to actually provide, hopefully to a, a big YouTube audience, um, uh, some education about how to take care of people with developmental disabilities. Pediatrics is a, uh, pediatric to adult transition is a very risky time. It's also risky because uh, as Lucy mentioned, the CCS, uh, 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 Children's Services, California Children's Services, provides uh, PT, OT, speech, a really big wraparound services. When the, when the child becomes 21 or 22 as a young adult, those services stop. In the adult world, there is nothing coordinated. There's mental health here, primary care here, IHSS here. Uh, and it's really left to the individual family member to help pull that all together. Transition planning should start about five years before the date that actual the CCS services will stop. I could go on, but I'm going to have to move on. Um, some of the other issues with uh, our adult health care system, this is, was a study that is kind of old, but it was done out of one of the um, regional centers down in um, Southern California, and they looked at they looked at uh, healthcare providers, uh, patients, families, caregivers, and really looked at some of the issues and barriers to healthcare for people with cognitive impairments, uh, physical impairments, and then also the attitudes of healthcare professionals. Um, and the list was fairly long, uh, but what, to me, what was most um, uh, interesting is that the average. It was noted that the average appointment for a healthcare visit was generally three times longer for somebody with uh, a disability. And part of the reason for that is the lack of proper equipment, proper staff, to make those appointments more efficient. I know Liz is going to talk about that. Um, and the lack of reimbursement to providers for actually having uh, more complicated and time-consuming visits. I do think we're seeing some change in, in reimbursement for that, but it's not fast enough. Uh, this was a report from the Surgeon General in 2001, and uh, unfortunately, we have not seen another report since that time, but some of the recommendations that came from this were very important um, to integrate health promotion into community environments for people with mental retardation was the term at the time. It should be intellectual disabilities. To increase knowledge and understanding of health and intellectual disability, ensuring that knowledge is made practical and easy to use. Improving the quality of health care for people by identifying priority areas, adapting standards of care, and rewarding excellence. I haven't gotten any rewards yet. Have you, uh, Lisa? <laughs> A little humor. Uh, training healthcare providers in the care of adults and children with intellectual disabilities. Again, we're really happy to be doing this series to provide some education and training. This is so terribly important. Um, ensuring that healthcare financing produces good quality health outcomes, and also increasing sources of healthcare services for people with um, uh, developmental disabilities that are easily accessible. And we have a ways to go. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the common uh, uh, syndromes or disorders that, that I see and that are commonly seen in, in, in adults in primary care, um, intellectual disability, autism, CP, uh, Down syndrome, and other genetic disorders, and epilepsy. I'm going to focus on some of the health issues that, that I've seen uh, and that are commonly seen. I'm um, not going to go through this slide much because Lucy's slide also talked about Fragile X. I think it's a really interesting uh, disorder in terms of the fact that this is a great example of how the human genome helped us to identify something. What I think is really fascinating is that um, 
now that it has been identified, we'll be able to follow it over time to really see what kind of healthcare issues and other issues do uh, emerge uh, from uh, individuals with this syndrome. Uh, and this is a little bit of the behavioral profile, which is uh, uh, very autistic-like, but again, as Lucy mentioned, not all individuals with Fragile X will have uh, intellectual disability or um, autism-type symptoms. We do have, we have seen a higher incidence of uh, hi hypertension, uh, low thyroid, and that's kind of a theme. Almost all individuals with developmental disabilities are at risk for uh, hypothyroidism over their lifetime. Uh, mitral valve prolapse, uh, Parkinsonism, uh, depression and anxiety, and then uh, a broad spectrum of learning disabilities, but interestingly to date, a fairly normal lifespan. Uh, moving on to some of the health problems seen in Down syndrome, and I think that we have t touched on this quite a bit um, throughout the uh, course of our, our series. Um, but uh, Down syndrome is, because it's been identified so early on, we actually know a lot about Down syndrome. It's probably the best known of all of the disorders uh, that cause developmental disabilities. So we do know that there is a higher incidence of hearing loss and speech disorders. Dysarthria is difficulty in speech. Again, low thyroid, um, vision problems. Uh, the hypotonia is that low muscle tone um, that uh, I think Dr. Uh, Chen had uh, dis uh, discussed in her talk on Down syndrome. And then that ligamentous laxity where the li ligaments are, are uh, loose and it's especially uh, concerning in the neck. Uh, so the uh, atlantoaxial instability is something we screen individuals for, especially those who are going to be doing sports and contact uh, activities um, uh, who have Down syndrome. Uh, cardiac disorders are oftentimes seen in children uh, and adults. I don't think the rate of cardiac disorders is greater than the general population, uh, but definitely in children. Uh, later on in life, some of those ills that we can all f uh, fall prey to, such as obesity, sleep apnea. Uh, but for people with Down syndrome, early mortality from infectious diseases, and that comes from some abnormalities that have been found um, uh, in the white blood cells, probably due to uh, genetics. Higher rates of celiac disease and intestinal disorder. And then, as been noted, um, an earlier onset of Alzheimer's. Not all individuals with Down syndrome will get Alzheimer's, but there's definitely a higher risk. So cerebral palsy, uh, Lucy touched on this uh, a little bit. Um, we see a lot of people, adults, with CP in primary care. Uh, it's. Uh, it's a very broad range of uh, static, meaning it doesn't usually change. It does not usually progress motor disabilities. And it's oftentimes seen uh, either at birth or in early childhood, and due to a number of different uh, nervous system um, insults. With CP, the, the use of muscles is always, uh, is always uh, impacted. Uh, there's oftentimes co-occurring seizure disorder. Uh, spasticity is generally present, and spasticity is something that can be very difficult, sometimes painful, and it's sort of a jerking motion, um, embarrassing, and probably all sorts of other adjectives. Um, speech disorders are common, and this speech disorders can be very um, hard for people to deal with when uh, individuals cannot understand them, uh, and sometimes they are perceived as having an intellectual disability when indeed they don't. Uh, so speech disorders are probably one of the most difficult um, issues with CP from my perspective, but I'll let you hear from the expert in a minute. Um, some of the medical problems with cerebral palsy, I talked about spasticity, but the other issue with CP, and you've probably seen, is, is this, this wrenching motion of the neck and shoulders. It is called dystonia and it can be a very distressing symptom. Not all po people with uh, CP have this, but those that do have expressed that this is, um, is very distressing. Um, mobility issues, um, it's interesting and always important to ask, 
how long you've been using a wheelchair for mobility. Some people walked, some people walked up until a year ago, and now today they're using a wheelchair. So it's important to know kind of what that history has been and, and actually how they're dealing, how they're dealing with it. Um, swallowing issues, because this is a neuromuscular disorder, swallowing issues can be, um, uh, can be life-threatening. And so evaluating people for aspiration and for swallowing is, is, really, is really important. Um, high rates of depression in adults with CP. Um, and interestingly, um, in the uh, 60 to 65 percent of, of those people with CP, CP are over age 20, so people are li definitely living longer, but the fastest growing population is over age 40. Although CP is said to be non-progressive, um, everything gets a little worse with aging, does it not? Um, so there's more fatigue, there's more mobility issues, there's more musculoskeletal issues in uh, an, in, an adult with CP, and probably at a little younger age than it would be for, for you or I. The swallowing is, as I said, an important issue, and aspiration pneumonia is the, um, the number one cause of mortality across all age groups. Just sort of moving on to autism, I'm not going to go through the definition which, uh, which Lucy did, um, but just some of the medical issues and challenges Autism is actually um, a, a disorder that doesn't generally have lots of medical problems associated with it. It's more communication and behavioral. Um, there are, um, people with autism can also have other co-occurring developmental disabilities. So it's oftentimes not a standalone. It occurs with person has autism and CP or autism and Down syndrome, et cetera. Uh, so, the, the um, medical problems seen with autism are oftentimes in the range of mental health issues and uh, behavioral issues, but sometimes seizures. We're all aging, we're all living longer, and I think it's very, very interesting to note that the current life expectancy for adults with developmental disabilities is 76.5 years. That's amazing. I had a... Um, a lawyer sent me a card. I don't usually like to get cards from lawyers, so I opened it a little nervously, and it was, congratulations, thanks for taking care of Marty, the miracle man, he just turned 40. And who would have thought that Marty would make it to 40? Marty was a patient that Lucy transitioned to me as the, his adult care, healthcare provider. Uh, I've gotten about half of my population has come from Lucy over the years, and so Marty, the miracle man, is still kicking. So. Where do people, adults with, uh, with developmental disability live? Um, children, mainly in family homes, uh, but adults also live in family homes and in group homes. And a very small percentage live in any kind of a higher level of, of care. So the majority of individuals, adults with developmental disabilities are actually quite independent and quite, uh, quite functional. But living at home has complications as well. Uh, and the biggest complication is the aging of caregivers and family. And this is a huge concern. 25% um, of those caregivers are over age 60. Um, the interesting thing is that sometimes the health of the caregiver can correlate to the health of the individual. So if the caregiver does not take care of themselves, then oftentimes the individual does not always get as much care as they need. Um, and we have seen that some of the routine preventive stuff, uh, preventive uh, screening tests, et cetera, are not done as frequently for individuals who are living at home with families. Health disparities in adults in this population are really glaring. And it has been uh, found that four, there's a four to, uh, six, four to six fold increase in preventable mortality in people with developmental disabilities when compared to the general population. So what does that mean? It means that individuals with developmental disabilities are not getting mammograms to the same rate as a, as a population, pap smears, uh, prostate exams, colonoscopies, uh, treadmill tests or any kind of stress tests. There's a whole slew of uh, tests that individuals with DD do not get as you and I do. And uh, I can't answer um, the question as to why, but I have certainly have thoughts about that. 
And again, that transition from pediatrics to adult care is especially vulnerable. Sometimes people fall through the cracks and don't emerge with health care until like 10 years later, unless that transition plan has really been laid out. Um, I've talked about most of the medical issues. I'll just highlight a couple more. Uh, we do tend to see more GERD for some reason. Uh, some of it probably has to do with the swallowing issues, but there just definitely is a higher incidence of GERD. Um, dental disease. Uh, uh, dental uh, care oftentimes goes by the wayside. Um, and uh, sometimes dental hygiene can be difficult to do, so we see high rates of dental disease. And osteoporosis, especially in individuals who do not bear weight or who are taking uh, anti-epileptic or anti-seizure medicines, higher rates of uh, osteoporosis. And then depression and mental health issues. So I think some, some of the things I've learned throughout the years about communicating and taking a history, um, it sounds really basic, but sometimes it's easy to forget, to talk to the person, uh, not necessarily to the caregiver first or to the, the pa to the parent, but actually to the person. And to speak to them on, uh, on, on, an, on eye level, um, sometimes there's nonverbal communication strategies that one has to use because the, in, the person is not verbal. Um, I've learned to treat wheelchairs as personal space. Sometimes we have a tendency to try to rush through things. And you know what? When somebody uses a wheelchair, it's like you're pushing at their legs. So don't touch the wheelchair unless they said it's okay to do that. Uh, admitting ignorance. If you can't understand somebody, you say, I can't understand you. Could you repeat that? Or asking the person to show you. Some of the uh, strategies that I've, uh, that I've learned over the years about uh, doing a physical exam, I mean, uh, is to leave clothes on and not necessarily feel like you have to get somebody uh, totally undressed. To start with the least threatening area first. Um, definitely to ask permission to touch. And here I thought I was so good. And this, this adult with autism came in, and he said he had a rash. And I just immediately went to touch it, and he just took my hand. And I thought to myself, you know, um, I thought I knew how to do this. But we always have to stop and think. When we're seeing somebody with a sensory processing issue, what's going to work for them? Uh, because not knowing that may send them away from health care. Um, asking about phobias, using distraction techniques. Uh, restraining is never done. I just put that on there so you'd probably go, gasp, she restrains patients. But what does help sometimes for people who are really agitated is a little bit of Ativan or a little bit of calming medicine before the appointment. So maybe you can get a little something done. Health promotion should be focused on diagnostic screening uh, that for the, for the general population, but also for uh, that is targeted towards whatever the syndrome or disorder is. Lifestyle modification, you know, like all of us, good nutrition, um, exercise, uh, uh, good mental health. Uh, lots of cultural humility sprinkled in because there's much we don't know about whatever the individual is dealing with, and always involving family and caregivers. There are some uh, specific screening guidelines that are consensus driven, uh, and uh, the, there are uh, references here on the slides. But some of the things to think about uh, routinely when seeing adults is to uh, touch base about any risk for abuse and neglect, um, any risk for that cervical atlantoaxial instability, dental, depression, diabetes, vision and hearing, obesity, osteoporosis, thyroid, polypharmacy, and safety. You can see why it takes a little bit longer to get things done. Um, this doesn't have to be accomplished in one visit. Certainly, oftentimes, I see patients back pretty frequently. So my case studies, I'm just going to mention really briefly. These are all people from my caseload. Um, Katie is a 19-year-old with Down syndrome. She used to be very happy and engaged with family and friends. Came in very withdrawn, talking to herself. Unfortunately, Katie uh, developed schizophrenia. Um, it has no relationship to her Down syndrome, but just like all 19 years, individuals who are 19 years old, that's the risky time for uh, a, a serious mental illness, a psychotic mental illness. Um, the point being that um, uh, 
Katie, just like all 19-year-olds, had that risk. Charles, a 54-year-old who was moderate ID and schizophrenia, who had spent many, many, many years institutionalized, came in grimacing, but he said everything was fine, because a lot of times people say everything is fine. Uh, and actually, Charles ended up having a gallbladder that the radiologist described as a porcelain gallbladder. It had been so filled with stones over the years, it was like a piece of china. Uh, so clearly, he had been in pain for many, many years. And no one had an, been able to interpret the fact that he had been in pain. So Charles had his gallbladder out, and now he really is fine. Uh, Sally is a 36-year-old female with autism and severe behavioral disorder. She bangs her head on the wall and bites her fist. She has some verbal skills, and, but she prefers to sing as a means of communication. And Sally is really difficult to do any kind of lab work on uh, or any kind of physical exam, despite having medication, because she takes medication from the psychiatrist. Um, Sally is one of the few people that when she goes in for hospital dentistry, I actually join the team and I will do a physical exam and other things uh, while she is under anesthesia, with consent, of course. Um, but there's a, a small percentage of patients with DD. This is the only way that they will get health care. Uh, Laura is a 26-year-old female. She has a genetic disorder. She was previously followed by Dr. Crane. She is uh, deaf and blind, communicates with gestures. Her, uh, on a routine physical, her abdomen appeared slightly distended. She ended up having ovarian cancer. Um, she had no complaints because she doesn't complain. The point about Laura is it's, it's important to do an exquisite physical exam for people who are not verbal because they won't tell you what's wrong. So behavior change, all behavior is a form of communication. When somebody is grimacing, uh, it, it, they're telling us something. Uh, when somebody is trying to run away, they're telling us something. It's really important not to do what's called diagnostic overshadowing, which means attributing everything to the disability. Uh, actually, the disability should be last on the list, and other things should be bubbled up to the, uh, to the surface. So the, some of the issues that can uh, cause behavior change are medical problems, medications, uh, substance use, abuse, mental illness, pain, uh, and the list here goes on. This was a study that, it's, it's an old study, but it was uh, a good sample of 1,100 patients with moderate to severe uh, intellectual disability. The mean age is 32, and 50% were nonverbal. These were all patients who had uh, behavioral change that the team, this team in Colorado could not, couldn't, was called in to try to evaluate why their, their behavior had changed. And out of, um, uh, out of the sample, these, this is the list of problems that they found uh, that were most likely contributing to some of that behavior change. And that once uh, treated, actually improved. In addition to the medical problems, this, this is the same sample of patients. They found psychiatric problems. And what I think is impressive about this is that 40% of the individuals who uh, d displayed behavior change were depressed. And 22% had PTSD. So it's a very high percentage of depression and PTSD. Again, it's pretty similar to what we see in the general population, and much less um, psychotic mental illness. So this is a little mnemonic about evaluating behavior change. It's called Hertz, uh, headaches, head trauma, dental, vision, hearing loss, urinary tract, reflux, thyroid, seizures, side effects. A little something to think about when you want to think about that. So I'd like to throw in a slide or two about sex because we don't we're so bad at asking people about sex. It's not a very comfortable topic. but And there's a lot of myths about people with developmental disabilities and sex. Uh, sometimes they're thought to have absolutely no, no interest, uh, that they're asexual, that they're only heterosexual, that they're hypersexual, that's a common myth, that they are inappropriate, and that they have no need for privacy. And we've actually really found that they're very diverse sexually. Um, there's a, there's a big range of skills with language, literacy, and communication, but with the right support that individuals with DD are capable of having very healthy sexual relationships. I have several patients who have partners, a couple who are married, 
I have a transgender patient. Uh, and, you know, it's, you just have to keep your mind open and not be pigeonholed into some of those myths about DD. Uh, questions about competency are important, though, because based on the cognitive uh, abilities of the individual, it is important to know um, if they have a sense about competency and supporting them in decision making about sexual health if indeed uh, that your competency is a question. Some of the resources for uh, here uh, in, in the Bay Area, um, certainly in the community, the Regional Center, the ARC um, Health Advocacy Program, uh, the Anchor Project uh, out at um, OMI Community Mental Health Center, uh, UOP, which is a special needs dental clinic, support for families. I'm really sorry I didn't put ToolWorks on the list. I apologize, uh, because it is actually, I did mention ToolWorks being one of my favorites, but it didn't get on the slide. I will change that. I'm forgiven. So at UCSF, we have patient relations, which actually has a list of uh, equipment that if you get hospitalized, you can actually uh, call patient relations and get certain equipment on their special list. And a room change. Um, as Dr. Kripke mentioned, the Office of Developmental Primary Care, the website is great. I've actually worked with her on some of the education materials, and that's um, really a rich resource. And then our hospital dentistry clinic. This is just a few different resources. Uh, the regional centers, Lucy really covered that. I just want to say that the role of the regional center in providing support to adults is really important. Um, and for healthcare providers, we need to advocate for our patients because the regional centers are very impacted and uh, their caseloads are big and somebody has to have a loud voice if the individual isn't getting what they need. So some strategies for success just in, in terms of healthcare, uh, creating a calm environment if that is ever possible, uh, allowing extra time, uh, explaining what to expect, uh, if you're not successful, back off, reapproach, um, and showing people equipment. So sometimes just talking about what we're going to do and then the next visit, trying to do it. I think some of the goals for healthcare providers should be, again, to follow the same guidelines you would for any individual uh, that needs uh, healthcare, but also recognize the special risk profiles for an individual with DD. Um, and try to adopt some of the strategies to overcome some of those obstacles. So I do have an exam table that does go up and down. Um, I do um, have a Hoyer lift available with now with staff that are trained, and you'll hear more about that. Um, this is just uh, to talk a little bit about the interprofessional team, because we can't do it alone. Uh, and so uh, there, each person should have a team to help them with, uh, with providing good care, which includes a variety of, spe um, of uh, specialists, uh, as well as community supports, um, and uh, caregivers are incredibly important. We don't have time to talk about conservatorship, informed consent, or advanced directives, but these are all issues that come up routinely for adults and uh, can, um, it's important to establish um, uh, whether the person is conserved and have copies of that in the medical records if indeed they are. Uh, it's important to understand the level of ability to consent because if you order a test and um, the radiologist thinks they can't consent, then the test won't get done. So these, are, these can be big issues. And advanced directives is a really nice tool that's been developed by some of the regional centers that makes is a simple advanced directive form. And um, uh, I've been using it, and I think it's very helpful. Um, advocacy is a really important role for us as healthcare providers. I can't emphasize it enough. Um, I think this is almost my last slide. But um, just to kind of wrap up, I think healthcare for adults with developmental disabilities uh, while we've made some progress, it continues to be a blind spot in our system. But I think if we work on the social environment, the physical environment, and we continue to train people, uh, that we can make a difference and reduce some of the effects of disabilities. So thank you. And I'm going to turn this over to Liz to speak now. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Grisby. I to have cerebral palsy, never leave home without it. It's 
better than a credit card. You can't lose it. I tried so many times. It doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I had cerebral palsy from birth. Um, I was a pre preemie, and the doctor told my foster mother the best thing for you to do was is to put her in an institution out of sight, out of mind. But my foster mother didn't listen to him, obviously. And he told her if I was to live, I'd be a vegetable for the, for the rest of my life. Or I wouldn't even live past one month. Well, I'm 44, and the guy is dead. <laughs> so what, what does that tell you? Um, um, I live on my own. I have my own apartment with the right support. I have people come in every day to help me with my physical needs. And I have somebody that goes with me to all my doctor appointments to um, and help me with the budgeting and stuff like that. And I have a job. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, people with disabilities can have a job. I work for a lovely Golden Gate Regional Center. I'm the consumer rights advocate. Um, I go out to different programs and give a spill about disability rights and so forth. And um, having cerebral palsy, like Jerry mentioned, is very, um, it's not a fun thing to have, especially when people who don't have disabilities treat you like you're an alien or they act really stupid towards you. I I say the people who act really stupid, they are the ones that have a disability. And we're just cool, cool people trying to figure out what the heck they're doing. Um, either people talk really loud to you like you c can't hear or they talk to you like you're a little kid like oh you honey you're so sweet you're so pretty how are you today and it's like you really call me sweet if you really knew me i don't think you would think so uh, um, um, but um, yeah, it's in my life every day. I'm even when I'm not working, I have to put on the advocacy hat and teach people that people with disabilities are just like everyone else. We want our life to be the way we want it. We, we want to thrive in the community. We pay taxes just like everyone else. We want a quote, unquote, normal life. Um, the thing that really um, amazes me when I I don't 
live too far from where I work. So I just rode to work in my, in my wheelchair. And on my way home from work, I get up at five, and people are like, it's a little bit rainy, I know. And this lady comes up to me a while ago, and she goes, oh dear, you better get under the doorway tonight. It's cold, it's gonna start raining. And I, le I, I was gonna keep going, but people who know me know I couldn't let this one go. I, so I turned around and I was like, excuse me. And she was like, yes, dear. You better get under the doorway tonight. It's gonna be really cold. And I'm like, first of all, I'm just getting off work and I'm going home to my apartment. What makes you think I'm homeless? And her, hus her husband and boyfriend, whoever he was, goes, dear, you did it again. <laughs> you, you put your foot in your mouth again. And she goes, you're not, oh my God, you're not homeless. And I'm like, no. She was like, I was about to give you some money because I thought you might be hungry. And I was like, nice gesture, but not everybody in a wheelchair that's going down Market Street is homeless. I don't have a cup. And even, even if I did, It'd be in my cup holder with, uh, with, with a drink or something in it. But, but people have this weird attitude about people with disabilities. It used to make me a lot more angry here than it does now. It, I just think it's funny. And about the medical profession, as Jerry mentioned, um, yes, we are su subject to, to have aspirated pneumonia and all that fun stuff. <coughs> and as much as I've been in UC, I should have my own wing, <laughs> but by now I'm the grizzly wing. But I I did spend five months in the hospital in 2009, because um, I did aspirate, and I did have aspirated pneumonia, which was hell. I mean, I'm hell on wheels already, but this was really hell. Um, because unbeknownst to me, a lot of nurses and professional doctors don't really know what to do with people with disabilities. They're like, uh, they really don't, get us, and so a lot of education needs to be done around people with developmental disabilities and within the medical field, because even though I was sick, I had to teach nurses and doctors that I wasn't what they were making me out to be because they kept saying my, my baseline was just a person lying in a bed. Man, that's 
all I was capable of doing. But Jerry as being my primary provider, care provider, um, came and advocated for me. And she was like, no, no, no. You don't know this woman. She's, a, she's an advocate. She lives on, lives on her own. She works. She's very um, active in the community because they wanted to put me in a SNF in a nursing home way down in Redwood City. And I wouldn't have any of my um, staff around me. I wouldn't have Jerry around. And she's my primary. But they wanted me to go to Redwood City. But I ended up going home because I'm a force to be reckoned with. I, I don't take, I'm not your typical person with a disability. If you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to prove it to you wrong and do it anyway, just because you say I can't. I love a challenge. And if you're going to sit there and challenge me, it's your, you have one thing coming, because I'm just, I'm a force to be reckoned with. And as far as being um, examined on Jerry's, in Jerry's office, she was right. For a while, we would have to call and and asked for the lift to team to come. And either they were out to lunch when we needed them. <laughs> so if she couldn't do the full examination, I would always have to sit stay in my chair. And not that I'm in love with pap smears by any means. I, I, I grow test them, actually. But I know they need to be done, so now with the whole year left, I'm willing to get on the table. It doesn't scare me as much as it used to when people try to two-person lift me. I don't know if you guys ever been too lifted by two people, but that's scary as hell. When you have CP and you have no control over your body whatsoever, and these two people are trying to lift you, and you're going into spasms, that's really fun. And people are telling you, try to stay still, dear. And you're like, yeah, right, what plan are you on? You, you're asking me to stay still? I have spasms. That's not going to happen. But, but that's what pe people used to say. Like the phlebotomist would tell me, oh, Miss Grisby. You just need to stretch on your arm, dear. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And what year is that going to happen? You need a second person to hold my arm straight. And they're, they're just looking at me like, why are you not holding your arm out? You know? And I'm looking at them like, what the hell am I saying to you? I can't. I have a disability. I have cere cerebral palsy. Medical books are, are fine, but if they don't really teach doctors and nurses and whatever, 
about people and their disabilities, then this is a sad state of, I mean, come on, this is almost 2015. Let's get it together, people. I mean, people with disabilities, unfortunately, our disabilities are not gonna be I'm not going to be uh, cured. I wish there was a pill I could take and the cerebral palsy would magically go away and I wouldn't have to have peer. I just ask people, get me up in the morning and be late all the time and having to lay in the bed in my diaper and wait for them, wondering when they're gonna get to my house. And I, w I wouldn't have to, to worry about get, getting something to eat when I go out by myself and I'm looking at all these, passing by, by all these restaurants, I wish I could go in, but I can't feed myself. So I'm like, I'm like wondering, I wish I could get a burger right now, but I'm by myself, so I'm gonna have to wait till I go home. And yes, you might say to yourself, well, why don't you have anybody with you at all times? That's the answer I get every day. And the answer to that, that is, I don't want everybody with me 24-7. That would drive me up the wall. I tell them to get the hell out of my face. You're bugging me. Even though I love my staff dearly, I don't want to look at them 24-7. I want my alone time, just like any other normal adults will like their alone time. I like to go out and <laughs> I don't know, window shop and do all kind of crazy stuff in my wheelchair. Don't worry, I'm safe when I speed up in the, the, down the street. People have to be scared of me more than me being scared that I'm going to hurt myself. I love scaring people on markets. Street, cause they they're like jumping out the way, <laughs> and I'm just like, it was my CP. I didn't have no control. <laughs> I played the CP card re really, really well when it served me my purpose. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hit you in the back of the leg, but it was just my CP. But, but the truth is, I wanted you to get out, out of my way. You didn't move fast enough. No. So, so I was gonna help you move. But, there's a lot of pe people when I go down the street and they know I have to use the curb cut because I'm getting ready to cross the street. They'll stand right on the curb cut and I'm like, oh, excuse me. And they just look at me and keep on talking. So I'm like, being real nice again. Excuse me, I need to get by. And they, 
look at me and keep talking. So the third time, I'm not nice anymore. I just go straight ahead and they're like, oh my God, she hit me. I'm like, I'm like, well, I told you to move. <laughs> I mean, I asked you nicely and you just stood there. Now who has the disability? <laughs> you or me? Let's see. But it's, it's just stuff like that. People, people need to realize that people with disabilities, whether it's cerebral palsy, whether it's Down syndrome, autism, whatever, it doesn't matter. We're people first. Our disabilities are second. Like Jerry said earlier, um, our disabilities is not our, our medical problems. We have other problems besides cerebral palsy. I too have sleep apnea, but I, when I told my, my doctor who I was seeing for a while, which I don't see no more because we didn't get along after the sleep apnea problem, but I kept telling her there's something wrong. I'm not breathing right. I'm not sleeping. And she kept turning me off, saying, oh, Liz, don't worry. It's just your CP. And I kept bringing it up to her. And she was like, you worry too much. It's just your CP, dear. And I guess she got sick of me bringing it up. So finally she did appease me and send me to the sleep apnea doctor. And he did the test. And he was like, why didn't your doctor uh, tell you about sleep apnea. He said, if you have, your heart is wor working over time when you sleep, so you're not getting a good enough sleep because your heart is pumping faster than it should. You have sleep apnea. So, me being me, who I am, the nice person. I went back to my doctor and I was like, I have sleep apnea. And she goes, oh, I know, dear. I got the, I got the email from the sleep doctor. Yes, <laughs> you have sleep apnea. And I was like, so you were making me think everything I told you had to do with my CP. And she said, mistakes, dear. And we all make mistakes. And I was like, yeah, you know, you're right. I made a mistake for leaving my old position over at UC because of my mother and I came to you. But now I'm about to correct my mistake and I'm about to leave you. You're no longer my position. And her eyes got really big and I was like, nice knowing you. Take care, but I'm going back to my old position. And I went back to Jerry Collins Bryan, who I never really wanted to leave, but listening to my foster mother, 
I did unwillingly, but now that I was grown, I made my own decisions, and I went back to Jerry, who we have a fantastic medical re relationship because we listen to each other. She listens to me, yeah. and it's it's very important that physicians and listen to their patients, whether they're nonverbal or verbal, or communicate in a different way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz.